Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to um, the next seminar from the IHR Digital History. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at um, interrogating the archived web, um, historians' experiences, uh, which comes from the um, Buddha Project, uh, which is run in conjunction with the IHR and the British Library and the Oxford Int Internet Institute, um, which is looking at the UK web archive and um, historians' experiences um, in researching it and utilizing um, that uh, web archive. Um, we've got three speakers um, this evening. Um, Dr. Peter Webster from the British Library, who was until recently, very, very recently, the engagement and liaison manager for the web archive. He um, is also um, still and still remains the main BL contact and person involved with the Buddha project. Um, and in his other guys, he researches church history and um, the relationship between um, church, state, and public. Um, our, uh, and Peter will introduce um, the um, Buddha project and give us a general contextualization and a view from the institution side, if you will, from the British Library. And then what we'll have is two speakers. Um, first of all, Dr. Gareth Millward, uh, Mil Millward from the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, his research, he's currently engaged as a postdoc researcher there, uh, involved in looking at post-war British vaccination policies. And in terms of Buddha, he's one of the Buddha researchers, and there he was looking at the role of disability organizations on the web and how they're perceived and shown on the web. And finally, you'll have myself, Richard Deswork from the University of East Anglia, uh, we're a European um, historian there, and I'm going to look at um, uh, Euroscepticism of the web archive. Um, I've um, researched on web archives and on the history of European integration um, and the European idea. Um, I should say we are. This is streamed live, so we also have followers. Or hopefully, we will have followers online. Um, those of you who are following online, the slideshow. So each of the individual slideshows are available on the blog or from the YouTube um, page. Um, so you can click on those and follow those live, and you don't necessarily have to um, follow it from um, the screen. Well, each of the speakers will be speaking for about fifteen to twenty minutes, and after that, there will be an opportunity. Um, for questions and answers. Um, I didn't check, but while we're doing a little switch over, there may also be, after the end of each of the speakers, a quick opportunity to ask any specific questions on detail while we, shall we make our switches between um, each of the speakers. So let me um, begin or pass over now um, to Dr. Peter Webster, um, who's going to introduce and discuss interrogating the web, UK web archive from the British Library. Thank you, Richard. Uh, um, good evening, everybody. Um, so yes, so, so to begin with, some, some basic information about the project configuration and who it is, in, is involved. It's led by uh, Dr. Jane Winters uh, from here at the IHR, and it's in partnership with ourselves, the British Library, and colleagues at the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, with the uh, consultant help of Professor Niels Brugger from Aarhus University in Denmark. And so the co-investigators are Ralph Schroeder and Eric Mayer, from, from, from Oxford, and Helen Hoxhugh, uh, Head of Web Archiving at the, at the BL. And the team also includes Jonathan Bain, uh, Project Manager, Josh Coles from the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, Andy Jackson, our technical lead at the BL, and myself. It was funded by the HRC to run for 15 months, and there is the, uh, there's the link to the project blog uh, at the bottom there. So, uh, it's a selection of some of the project aims. This isn't everything the project is concerned to do, but they're most, mostly what we're interested in here today. Uh, it aims to, at a most basic level, draw attention to the value of web archives as a, as a source of humanities research and to understand and transform the way in which researchers can interact with this data. Um, it's also concerned with um, thinking about what the theoretical and methodological framework for the analysis of web archives look like, focusing on a particular um, data set, which I'll introduce in a second. And, uh, and along and related to that, to think about the ethical implications of big data research as they relate to the web. And fourthly, and most and where I've been involved most directly, to uh, that is it aims to inform the collection development and particularly access arrangements for the UK web archive in all of its in all the terms at the British Library. And so what will it produce? The outputs of these, uh, it will produce a suite of uh, analytic and visualization tools um, embedded, which will be embedded within the user interface 
uh, for the use of researchers. Um, that the general interface which already exists in Prototype will, will be further enhanced to accommodate those and to facilitate access to the material. Uh, it, the, the colleagues in Oxford are leading on uh, on developing a history, as it were, a very short history of the development of the UK web space from 1996 until until last year, which is the period covered by the data. Um, um, there's also a series of case studies. Uh, by, there are 11 uh, holders of bursaries that the project has has put uh, has put out um, from across the arts and humanities disciplines. Two of whom I'm joined by today, and, and at least one more of the bursary holders is here. Um, and looking at bringing small small scale research projects to to the interface to help us develop um, what it should do and, and how best to to enable that work to happen. There are two project workshops, one of which has already happened, one of which I'll talk about in a minute, and also a free online training module uh, illustrating the use of web archives in general, general terms. That uh, forthcoming event is on the 3rd of December here, also at Senate House. Um, uh, and so it is, uh, so there are details there and the booking, booking via that uh, uh, very bright uh, link. Still plenty of tickets left, I think, so far. Um, so you'll hear more from, uh, actually, I think, a further iteration of what uh, Richard and Gareth are saying, but also from the rest of the first responders, and some plenaries looking at big data as a historical issue, more generally speaking. Um, so those of you who have been coming to the seminar for a while may remember that actually Richard and I spoke about similar things uh, not all that long ago, um, reporting on a predecessor project to the Buddha project um, known as ARDA, the Analytical Access to the Domain Dark Archive, which was funded by the JISC and ended about 18 months ago. Um, and at that time, we tried to pose um, what we thought were some of the emerging issues about what, what is in fact a new class of primary source for historians. That actually, the, the archive web has, as it were, philological and methodological questions that are not alike to any other class of archive material, as such that, we, that there's, a, there's a whole conversation about how we use these in the first place that we need to be having. Um, so we just, and we put that out there. And since then, um, uh, there's been an opportunity to test and see how far and how deep the engagement of historians has been with this material worldwide. Um, we've managed to do this um, myself and a colleague in the University of Waterloo, Ontario, Dr. Ian Milligan, set up Web Archive Historian, Web Archives for Historians, which is uh, in this first stage a crowdsourced bibliography of writings relating uh, uh, by or for historians about how uh, how they intend to or have been using archive web material. And we found, and so it's a very, very interesting exercise, but we found that the pool was shallow. We found that we got to the list quite quickly, even being very Catholic in the formats that we were prepared to, to, to admit to the bibliography in terms of uh, uh, blog posts, reports, um, conference presentations, as well as formal research output, outputs. And we found that the pool was small. And I think there are various reasons for that cultural, uh, th th there are cultural barriers uh, to that, which I can talk about, but I don't particularly want to go into now. But some of those issues are picked up in, in, the, <coughs> in the podcast of that seminar, um, which is available from that URL there, should you be interested to follow any of that up. So, but I need to put this, back to this particular project, I need to put it into some context. Um, the UK Web Archive is in fact three archives in one all of which actually are, are compiled on slightly different bases and have slightly different access arrangements attached to them. Um, the, the one which you're most likely to be familiar with is the Open UK Web Archive, which is a curated, hand curated, um, catalogued, um, small scale permissions based archive, which has been in the making since 2004. And that's available publicly at webarchive.org.uk. Since last year, however, since last April, the library in conjunction with the five other legal deposit libraries for the, for the United Kingdom have had the rights to receive a copy of any non-print publication from the UK, an extension of the, of the, the legal deposit right which we're familiar with the printed material. And that, in this context, also applies to the open web. And so since last year, uh, we um, started collecting, what well, at least once a year, between four and five million individual web hosts in any one year. Um, about 4 million individual URLs in 2013. And then the third uh, data set, which is what I want to talk about today, is the JISC uh, UK web domain data set. And some details of that are here. Um, the JISC, on, as it were, on behalf of the nation, uh, bought from the Internet Archive uh, a complete set of their holdings for the .uk 
domain from 1996 to 2013. So the Internet Archive, available at archive.org, is a San Francisco-based philanthropic organization who set themselves the task of archiving, as, archiving everything they could find online from 1996. And so it is the biggest single web archive in existence and, and is unique, so there is nothing else like it as such. And so, as I said, we have a copy of, this, of the .uk subset of that, that data. Um, which was the GIST port and entrusted to the British Library for safekeeping. Um, we're not able, for, for reasons I can go into, we're not able to provide local access to those individual pages. Uh, but what we can do is build search and filter and other access mechanisms on top of that content and then send users back to the Internet Archive's own interface if they want to see the pages themselves. And we can also generate secondary data sets from within it, and there are a number of those which are then available in the public domain. But I don't intend to talk about those today particularly. It's worth taking a minute just to think about what the general, if it's possible to categorize what the use case is for, uh, an user interface for archive web material actually are. Some of these are more familiar than others. Some of them are enabled uh, uh, more than others in different contexts. The most familiar uh, uh, mechanism, um, which is, uh, and by, by and large, is the one that's adopted by most web archives around the world, is a, a, a full text or, or full text search or browse that leads you, clicks you through to view an individual archive web page in, in uh, replayed in the browser as if it were a live one. Um, what is less uh, well embedded anywhere is full text search that then leads to analysis and visualization of those results in the abstract. Um, a third step, which is something which uh, a requirement that was articulated very clearly by the researchers on this project, was actually was, was moving from a search to fixing what we what we call what we term to the corpus, that's to say identifying a subset of material within the larger data set, uh, which which users can then start to do additional things with themselves. And these are kind of bespoke to individual researchers. If I say there are just 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 north of two billion individual resources, that say individual files in this, in this archive, it became very clear to us that actually some means of subsetting that on demand was going to be essential if actually there was any means of finding it, any useful, useful and meaningful results within it. Um, and then move fourthly, moving from that form, that creation of a corpus as it were, to do further full text searching uh, within that data, then leading to new individual resources. There was also a need to do, so, to do further fine-grained searching within the corpus, then leading to analysis and visualization of those of that secondary search result. And those are the five uh, use cases which the, the user interface that this project is developing is uh, designed to, uh, to, to serve. Um, the final two are, uh, are actually the, the derivation of data sets with, uh, which users can download, take away, and use on their own local infrastructure and local machines, um, and also uh, there is a, a very small, but very dedicated, dedicated group of scholars who want direct access to the archival files themselves to take away and use. And, use. and this is the model that the Internet Archive have been have just trialing and starting to enable. It's worth just thinking about what it is that we know about any of this any of this data, because what in, the, in effect uh, Gareth and Rich and I have been talking about this over coffee, and there's a sense in what you have here is an archive without a catalog defined in the traditional terms. There are 2.2 billion individual resources in this, in this, in this data set. Um, they will never be catalogued in the sense that no, no human being will ever create a descriptive record of each of those individual things. So at level, we're dependent on the data that we can know in an automated, scalable, machine-run way about it. And so from the data that was collected when the the archive material was first gathered, we can know the date in which that happened, uh, and we can know the URL from which that, that data came, and we can know what the file format is, mostly, and we can know how large that file is. Um, once we then created a full text index of the whole, and it's worth saying that actually, uh, I have to, uh, uh, that actually the, the index that we've, been, we've created for this data is the largest um, full text index of the web archive material in public hands in the world, it's by, by some distance. Uh, you see that actually there's, there's, there's been some major technical uh, challenges along the way in making this thing work. And from the full text index, we can know what the, the title of an HTML page is, if it's declared in the right way. Uh, we can know 
um, where the destinations of links within that content are based. So we know that, that, that site A in fact links to, to another one. We can sometimes know that there, there's an author attached to a piece of content if it's declared. We can sometimes know what language it's delivered in, mostly, if uh, that's to say that's to say English or Spanish rather than rather than technical language. Sometimes, not always. What don't we know about any of this stuff? It's all the stuff that's in your traditional catalog. So we don't we don't so we can't know um, in in in, well, in an easy way what the subject scope of any particular piece of content is. We can't know what kind of geographic scope it has. Although we can infer these things. But not in not in a very safe or very scalable way. Um, we don't know who the publisher is. We know which URL something came from, but the mapping of publishers to URLs is not an exact science by any means. Crucially, we don't know when something was first published online. The dating that we have is the date at which something was found online, not the date in which it was published necessarily. And, and we can't know when something changed. If we have two copies or instances, as it's called, of the same content, we can know that they have changed in between those two points. What we can't know is at what point the change was made. So, so it's, we have to work around all of these particular limitations of the data that, that we're dealing with. Um, those, that is a, a very quick introduction to, to what, we, what, what, we, what we've been doing. Um, 